Yeah. So uh, once again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome you to AIOC 2021, the 79th conference of All India Ophthalmological Society. The theme of the conference is bridging the evidence to practice gap. And starting with our first session, I would like to invite Dr. I would like to invite Dr. Madhu Udaraju, as he is the chairperson. I request the chairperson to take over this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvi. Yeah. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. So today morning, we have a very interesting session on keratoconus. Uh, this is like an update for general ophthalmologists about what new is going on in keratoconus. As all of us know, keratoconus is a constantly evolving area. And uh, to start this session, I request Dr. Tushar Grover from Delhi, uh, who has been trained at uh, Aravind and Narayan Netralaya. And he has done good work in corneal biomechanics. So to start with, he'll be talking about newer concepts in corneal biomechanics. Tushar? Yes, I'll just share my screen. So a very good morning and my sincere gratitude to Dr. Madhu for having me in this IC. So I'll be talking about diagnosing keratoconus and I'll start with a little bit of tomography because we intend to speak to the general ophthalmologist, but we'll focus primarily on biomechanics and that's how the presentation would go. So just a brief on corneal tomography. This is the map that we are all extremely familiar with called the four map refractive. There are just a certain things that we need to look carefully before we go for any examination. So I'll go over them very quickly. Um, the important thing, one, one of the important things is look for the quality specification. If there are any errors there, do not, uh, you know, try and repeat the scans. Look for the color scale and make sure that's matching in your examinations. These curvature maps, elevation maps, we are all very well aware of the they point out early ectasia and those individuals who are suspicious for ectasia as well. Again, the corneal thickness map here, this is where the numerical values are. So we are all good at picking up these cases of keratoconus. Like in this case, you can see steepening, elevation, thinning. This is a case of pellucid marginal degeneration, as you would know, the crab claw pattern, inferior elevation, thinning. So just an overview of the basics to begin with. And this is the bad D map, which shows the exclusion map, which excludes the central 4 mm of the best fit sphere. And therefore is able to pick up subtle ectasia, which you might have otherwise make, uh, missed. So these are the corneal thickness, spatial profile, percentage thickness increase, the, the, the standard deviations and the D values. So these are all indicators in tomography that help us pick out those early cases of ectasia, which we might have missed. So I'm not going into too much detail in this. This is the topometric KC staging map, which gives you the Bellin ABCD keratoconus staging, gives you the asphericity of cornea in, in various meridians, and you get various indices. All of these, again, help you pick up fine ectasia or early ectasia. So moving on to the major agenda, which is corneal biomechanics. Why do we really need to know corneal biomechanics? The reason is that the cornea, as this paper has pointed out, is not a piece of plastic. Cornea has viscoelastic properties, which means a combination of viscosity and elasticity. And it is these properties that manifest before any morphological changes of ectasia that you would see on tomography. So if we are able to pick these early, we can actually prevent the development of morphological ectasia. So how do we measure corneal biomechanics? There are two different devices that are commercially available. The first one is the ocular response analyzer. So this was the first one to be introduced, which was launched in 2004. It uses a bi-directional applanation process using an air puff and gives you two parameters, which is the corneal hysteresis and corneal resistance factor, both measures of viscoelasticity of the cornea. And it's quite evident as in this image that, you know, these parameters are reduced in weaker corneas. Uh, for example, the ones who have keratoconus. The limitations of this machine is that it's not really that's sensitive. It's not able to pick up fine variations by itself. So just by itself, it's not enough to have this modality. You need other modalities to complement this. And also the exact correlations of this with true measures of corneal mechanical properties is, is still not completely known. The newer device 
which we now have, which is more uh, commonly used and is gaining a lot of functionality with time is the Corvus ST, which does air puff induced applanation and uses a shine flock camera to take multiple images to look at the corneal deformation that happens. Unfortunately, that video is not working, but if, if you have the air puff applanation happening, you would see the deformation of the cornea. So this gives you various dynamic corneal response parameters like the deformation amplitude, which you expect would be higher in a weaker cornea, deformation amplitude ratio, the radius of curvature, all these parameters by itself also give you a lot of knowledge about the biomechanical strength of the cornea. So for example, in keratoconus, you would see factors like an earlier first applanation because it's a weaker cornea. You would see greater deformation amplitude, like I just mentioned. You would also see a delayed corneal recovery this is the recovery phase after the applanation. So these are all things that you would see. So just by these parameters also, you can come into decision making. So for example, this is a cornea which is thin and has extremely low deformation amplitude. So when you, you might otherwise consider this for PRK because it's not a, it's not a very weak, it's not a very thin cornea. There's no elevation, but considering the biomechanics, you would not want to do any surgery on this particular patient. Whereas say this patient has a borderline pachymetry of 500 microns, but extremely good biomechanics, the deformation amplitude is quite low. So such a patient you can even, you know, take up for LASIK, not just PRK. So, but like I mentioned, these parameters by itself are difficult to look at and difficult to really analyze. So what you really need is some normative data, which can compare them to the population figures and what is normal in the population. So the Vinci Guerra screening report was able to do that. And what it also gave you is the Corvus biomechanical index. So again, this was developed using linear regression analysis and uses various uh, dynamic uh, corneal response parameters that I told you about, the st uh, one stiffness parameter and also the horizontal thickness. So here you have one index which you can look at and with a, a reasonable amount of certainty say that this cornea is biomechanically strong or weak. So this was this has been found to have very high sensitivity and specificity in early keratoconus cases as well. The next need was felt to be able to integrate tomography and biomechanics. Like in the example that I showed you, we had to look at tomography and biomechanics separately and then take a call ourselves. What if we had one index which could look at both and tell us how strong or weak the cornea is biomechanically? So that's where the tomographic biomechanical index helps. It, this has been found to have in multiple validation studies, the highest sensitivity. So this basically, as you can see, is combining data from the Corvus and the Pentacam and has been found to have the highest sensitivity in detecting subclinical or formi frusty keratoconus. So this is a typical map of the tomographic biomechanical index where you see the Pentacam pretty much looks okay. The bad D is fine. But you know, when you look at the biomechanics and take that into account, the tomographic biomechanical index, which you see right at the bottom, is quite high. So this case, even though the tomography is normal, you should classify this case as a subclinical keratoconus and really not intervene surgically if this patient wants refractive surgery. Then there are some newer indices of corneal biomechanics that are available now and that have been more recently introduced because, like I said, the Corvus is gaining functionality quite a lot because of the popularity that it has gained. Uh, one of the things that uh, it tells you is the stress strain curve and the stress strain index. So this by itself for one particular individual, uh, this by itself for comparing multiple individuals is not very useful. But when you look at one cornea serially over time, then this does provide a lot of value. So, you know, if you have uh, uh, the stress strain curve moving to the right, that means the cornea is becoming biomechanically weaker with time. And if it is moving to the left, that means the cornea is becoming stiffer or biomechanically stronger. So there is also a stress strain index that has been described uh, to help you look at these values. The value of one has been taken as the average elasticity of a healthy corneal tissue based on the normative data and the regression analysis that they have done. And this is also based on finite modeling that, that has been done by these authors. So again, value of one uh, indicating average elasticity, value of more than one is stiffer behavior, less than one is softer behavior. And this is also one of the first clinical parameters that can actually identify stiffening after corneal cross-linkings. The other parameters 
by themselves were not sensitive enough to pick up those fine changes, but the stress strain index is able to do that. The, the final index that I'll be talking about is called the CBI LVC, which is intended for patients who've undergone laser vision correction. So otherwise, all the other parameters appear normal, abnormal in these corneas. But here, it automatically picks up that this particular patient has undergone a laser vision correction, and you're able to differentiate between stabilized post-refractive surgery versus eyes that develop ectasia or that could develop ectasia after LVC. So this is particularly useful for these patients. So just to summarize advances in shine flog imaging technology, whether it is in tomography or in biomechanics, help us detect keratoconus at a very early stage, uh, at the subclinical stage or the formi frusty stage, which was absolutely not possible earlier. And biomechanics, though I do believe is, is still in its infancy, has really added a new dimension for us to look at when we take our decision on whether this particular patient has ectasia or not, or whether you should take up a patient for refractive surgery or not. And the future, I do believe, lies in combining tomography with biomechanics. And it is meant to not just help us diagnose keratoconus or diagnose ectasia, but to be able to detect weak corneas in their infancy before they even develop ectasia so that we can treat them or at least prevent the development of ectasia by not intervening with a refractive surgery. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Tushar. That was a wonderful presentation. I think you beautifully wrapped up biomechanics in such a short time. Thank you once again. I think uh, next we have Dr. Divya from Arvind Chennai. Uh, Ma'am has done her fellowship again from Arvind Madurai and uh, she'll be speaking about uh, topo-guided PRK. Usually for a general ophthalmologist, uh, any refractive procedure for keratoconus is a no-no. So I think this would be an enlightening uh, lecture by Dr. Divya. Please go ahead, ma'am. Ma'am, you are not thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madhu, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be a part of this uh, interesting uh, session. So I'll be discussing about topo-guided PRK and uh, collagen cross-linking. So uh, the use of topical riboflavin combined with ultraviolet irradiation and collagen cross-linking has been uh, you know, well established and we all know that it halts the progression of keratoconus. However, the surface irregularity remains the same and uh, patients still complain of uh, you know, some kind of visual disturbance. They're not totally happy post uh, uh, CXL surgery. So, uh, you know, keeping in mind uh, the time constraint, I'm not going much into the collagen cross-linking. I'll discuss more about the topo-guided uh, procedures. So we know that there are two customized approaches for treating uh, irregular astigmatism. So one is the wavefront guided and the other one is the corneal topography guided treatments. So uh, the wavefront guided treatment was used in the past, uh, but however, now it's not uh, I mean, we don't recommend that much because of, uh, you know, the problem of repeatability in these eyes. So again, topography-guided uh, topography eczema laser ablation was introduced uh, originally to treat uh, highly abraded and irregular uh, corneas. And uh, the concept of laser ablation uh, is basically to alter the co cornea by treating the anatomical structure rather than the physiological changes that actually happens. And uh, since the procedure is done after removing the epithelium, uh, similar to what we do in PRK, we can, you know, interchange uh, the terms and, uh, you know, call it topo-guided PRK as well, so TPRK. So it's basically a, a custom ablation treatment and a, a procedure of limited uh, ablation of the cornea using eczema laser with the aim of regularizing the cornea, improving the quality of vision and possibly better contact lens fitting as well. So we, how, how does it actually work? So as I already uh, told you, it's only done to improve the topography and the corrected distance uh, visual uh, equity. The refraction is always not uh, predictable. You cannot predict. It is only done to, uh, you know, uh, to, to give you a good topographic uh, structure of the cornea. So basically what it does is it flattens the cone peak and as well as the broader area away from the cone. So there's a myopic ablation in the uh, cone peak and hyperopic ablation in the periphery. So basically, uh, you know, the, uh, it causes uh, flattening of the cone. 
and the peripheral area is steepened a bit. And uh, flatter and broader cone distributes the biomechanical strain and may further be enhanced by CXL. So the basic workup uh, will be uh, refraction as we do in all cases, topography and uh, the, the wavefront scans as well. So how do you choose your patient? Uh, patient uh, will be chosen uh, by, you know, with a minimal pre-op thickness of at least 450 microns. Uh, corneas with thinner, uh, uh, less than 450 microns is not advisable. And minimal post-operative thickness should be 400. And desired thickness after the procedure, that's after you remove the corneal epithelium and all that should be 350 microns. So maximum uh, ablation, again, uh, as we all, um, we said, it's only attempting to correct the uh, sphere. And uh, uh, we do not correct the whole optical defect uh, in the eye. So uh, maximum ablation should not be more than 50 microns. And the spherical equivalent, again, should be less than uh, six diopters and optical zone we can choose somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5 though some of them suggest even uh, five uh, millimeters uh, again uh, you should choose cases which have mild to moderate grade of keratoconus definitely a no for very high grade of keratoconus thinness pachymetry should be uh, 450 microns and above if the patient has poor contact lens fit or is unhappy with glasses or contact lenses this can be tried and again, no uh, central scarring of the cornea and no ocular inflammation or other allergic eye diseases. So coming to the planning, we would actually look at a series of scans. So, you know, when we take uh, scans on the topolizer, it will give us a series of scans. A uh, minimum of four to six uh, scans are being done. And um, in the scan, again, uh, you would see this, uh, the mean uh, deviation score. So this score should be less than 0.1. Uh, and uh, how do you say that, you know, you, how your machine will actually tell you, I mean, if you have a score of uh, more than 0 0.1, then that gets negated. So that's how you choose your repeatable scans. Again, uh, the skew value is uh, very important. And um, if the skew value actually depends on the location of the cone and the keratoconus, uh, Rohit Chetty, sir, and Narayan Netralia team has come up with, you know, something like a nomogram as to how to alter the Q values. So um, uh, when, you know, in this, when you do TCAT in a patient with a cone in the central zone, the central zone means when the, it is bit, uh, within the three millimeter zone, there will be a high negative Q value and a high myopic uh, refractive error uh, as well. So for these, what you could do is you could reduce the Q value to a less negative value or apply a partial refractive correction because we are not bothered about completely uh, correcting the refraction here. We only want to regularize the cornea. So, and you ha also have to make sure that your thinness pachymetry is more than 475 microns and spherical equivalent of less than six diopters. Again, uh, when you have a when your cone is away from the central zone, that is more than five uh, millimeters, uh, more than three millimeters away, then you need to have a, you will have a negative uh, Q value or even a positive Q value is possible. So here you can change your Q to be a zero. And uh, coming to the planning. So again, uh, you know, this is how your uh, screen would look for the planning. And uh, the me measured sphere might not be uh, that accurate uh, because this is a placido-based uh, measurement. So we would go more with the uh, the the, the uh, sphere that the um, the machine picks up, and we're more concerned about the cylinder here. So what we would do is uh, we would go and the axis again. You know, there is something that we measure and something that the machine picks up. In these cases, it's always better to go with what the machine uh, tells us. If there is a lot of uh, difference between the two, then we will have to look at the anterior uh, float and see what uh, axis it corresponds to in the steepest uh, region. Again, uh, treatment, uh, when you plan for your treatment and all that. So in this case, you can see the, the actual refraction was 2.5 with the minus three cylinder at 165 degree axis, but measured was minus 0.7. Uh, with 4.76 at 177 axis, we've gone ahead and uh, treated and the residual stroma is about 394 microns and maximum ablation is uh, less than 50 microns as already described. So again, uh, coming to the uh, surgical procedure, as we all know, uh, there is debridement of the corneal epithelium for about eight millimeters. Laser ablation is performed. 
bed is washed and riboflavin is applied every two minutes for 20 minutes and every two minutes uh, during uh, the uh, UVA radiation as well. And patient is then started on topical uh, steroids in tapering doses and also antibiotics given. So these are some studies uh, that has compared uh, the efficacy of uh, uh, the topo-guided PRK. So they've concluded that uh, same day simultaneous topography guided PRK and collagen cross-linking appears to be superior than sequential uh, PRK. So here they divided about 325 eyes and you know they divided the patients into one group undergoing uh, CXL first and then followed by uh, PRK six months later, the sequential group. And the other group was the simultaneous group where it was done on the same day. They concluded that same day was much better. And this is a study uh, showing the safety and efficacy of um, uh, the uh, Guided, uh, topo guided PRK. So again, here they've uh, concluded that uh, PR, PRK followed by CXL is a promising treatment. So to conclude, uh, patient selection is very important. You cannot go and choose patients with very high keratoconus. Uh, patients with mild to moderate are, are really uh, good uh, patients uh, to perform this surgery on. And again, you have to talk to your patients well. You know, you have to tell them what to expect from surgery because any refractive procedure, they think of uh, only, you know, getting uh, good vision and they are uh, always uh, concerned about the vision. So you have to tell them that this is more to address the abrasions and not to Did we lose the connection from Dr. Divya? Uh, yes, I guess there's some technical glitch from her end. That's okay. I think she just finished her presentation. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Divya, ma'am, for that wonderful presentation. I think I should doubly thank you because uh, you just recovered from COVID and despite that, you put your time and energy to honor this academic commitment. Thank you once again. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sujata Mohan, ma'am. I think uh, she has a parallel session elsewhere. So she'll join us uh, in some time. So meanwhile, we can go to the next speaker, Dr. Soham Basak, who is again a close friend of mine. He completed his residency from Arvind Madurai and now being trained in cornea under the legend himself, Dr. Samar Basak. And he is a no-nonsense man himself. So I expect a very lucid and wonderful presentation from him. Soham, please go ahead. He'll be speaking about uh, uh, dark for beginners, practical and lucid from Soham to you. Thank you, Dr. Madhu, for the very kind words and uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll be talking about uh, how to go about dark in beginners. I have no financial interest in this talk. Are my slides visible? Yes, so um, they're quite visible. You can go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so DALC, as a beginner surgeon, it's always intimidating because it has a steep learning curve, so many techniques to learn and master with some unique complications. So before going on to the OT, it's highly recommended that you do some wet labs, watch plenty of videos, and if possible, spend some time with some seniors or mentors who are already doing the surgery. And what will be the ideal case to begin with? So choose someone who has a less than 660 vision so that the post-op improvement is appreciated by the patient. That's very important. Pick someone with advanced keratoconus with poor contact lens fitting, preferably under general anesthesia. These cases initially tend to be quite long, more than an hour, and you don't want the patient getting jittery on the operation table. So preferably under general anesthesia. Have backup optical tissue if you do not have an eye bank of your own because anytime you need to convert and you might see that you are stuck with some low quality tissue. So it's always better to have a optical grade tissue as a backup on table. And if it's the first few cases, make sure your assistants know that you're going to do dark so all the instruments are ready. And uh, for uh, very first few cases, it's better to avoid these post hydrops eyes and eyes with severe VKC and complications of VKC. And also very important when you're preoperatively counseling the patient, don't commit to DALC or promise DALC. So I still usually write DALC oblique PK because there's always that 5-10% chance that you might need to convert on tape. So coming to manual DALC, so it's 
the outcomes really if you look at it if the if you have re reached a residual stromal depth of less than 80 microns the visual outcomes are comparable to that of big bubble dal and actually in fact it is the preferred technique where you have previous high drops and very dense scars or in cases of failed big bubble attempts where you have to convert to a manual technique so before going on the investigations, most important here is a thickness map, which you can have either with the anterior segment OCT or with your tomographic device. Additionally, specular counts always helps so that you know how long, have an idea of how long the graph will go on for. Clinical photography for your documentation purpose. Instruments, few instruments that you need specifically are, now you have these guarded depth tree finds from the Madhu instruments. And also if you have access to a barren Hesbach tree find, nothing like that. Similarly with guarded blades, you can have fixed guarded blades or you can use the uh, various diamond blades with uh, variable depth adjustments for making the incision. Otherwise you need a set of good blunt scissors and blunt dissectors and maybe have a portable pachymeter in the OT. So the various techniques, there's the layer by layer dissection which I shall be showing in subsequent videos. Then there is Millie's air assisted technique where the depth is sort of judged by injecting an air bubble. And then there is the Arcula technique where the corneal stroma is insufflated with air. So the dissection depth is made more clear. So coming to the first video here. So this is a case of advanced keratoconus with previous high drops. Look at the dense scar obscuring the pupil. And we start by, this is one of my very few cases, in fact. So start with the measurement and marking. Then I put a flaringer ring in anticipation of probable perforation and a partial depth of finish. I mean, using a simple handheld to find. And then the groove is deepened with a crescent blade. And I'm using a groove and set technique. So where I do not touch the central cornea. So I make a groove using blunt scissor dissection along the trefine margin where the cornea is relatively thicker. So there is a margin of error over there. So go around making a one and a half to two millimeter wide groove. And the depth is sort of judged by the eye. And this is just a blunt dissection technique. The scissors I'm using, this is a peritomy scissors, which I'm very comfortable with somehow. So you can use this, any corneal scissors, anything which has got a blunt tip, that is most important. So you do not want the in an inadvertent corneal perforation. And make sure whenever you're doing any step of dissection or the snipping action, make sure that the blades are as horizontal as possible. So sometimes after one round of the groove, if you are not happy with the depth, go and make the groove, like go in in a spiral fashion and sort of do a groove the second time. So here you can see the two layers, the superficial layer, which I did initially, and now the deeper layer, which I'm doing. So the corneal, the iris depths of the underlying uh, from where the rest, stromal residue, that sort of gives you an idea of how deep you have gone. And once the groove is complete, it's a matter of stromal separation. This is using an iris spatula. So no sharp instruments to be used in the central cornea. Just lift up the edge. And when you can see the stromal fibers, gently separate them with using a blunt dissector like this. And here you can see the shiny reflex of the decimates or the pre-decimates layer in the central part. So that is a satisfactory endpoint for the for this surgery. And any peripheral tissue that you are unhappy with can be dissected at this point of time. However, it does not matter much in the long run, even if you have 
maybe a hundred microns in the periphery, the clinical outcomes doesn't really change as long as your central five millimeters are really well dissected. Graft preparation, you stain with tripen blue and gently peel off the DM endothelium complex. This is quite similar to how you would do a DMA graft preparation. And then for suturing, I prefer a, an interrupted technique with a 10 0 nylon sutures. And then that's the end of the surgery. You can check with the keratoscope to see if there are any astigmatism adjustment to be done. So this is at uh, day three, you can see the residual stroma is almost as thick as the epithelium. So you know it will be somewhere around 50 microns to 70, 80 microns. This is quite satisfactory. This is a second case, again, very advanced keratoconus with extremely thin corneas. Just look at the K reading also of more than 90. So again, begin with uh, partial depth refination and making a small stromal pocket, which will now be extended using the groove technique with the scissors. Sorry about that. So the safety of this technique is this. So you are not at all going anywhere near the thinner part of the cornea and everything is essentially a blunt dissection. And the beauty again is here you're not entering the AC. So this is just a completely extraocular procedure. So in terms of the infection part of it, inter intraocular infection part of it, again, that little bit safety is maintained. So here we, are, we have gone one round and we are continuing the groove after the first round. And once uh, the good depth is achieved, remove the central part using blunt dissection with the iris spatula. So look at this, this is your stretching the stromal fibers and you're just gently sort of disinserting those fibers from the underlying bed. And again, this change in reflex to a more shiny that indicates that you have reached close to the desmet membrane. So as tempting as it might be, sometimes it is better to leave behind some of these residual fibers because Trying to be perfect sometimes lands you with more complications. Again, similar interrupted 10 0 nylon sutures to secure the graft in place. And this is at day 10 post op. You can look at that the almost entire, almost the entirety, the residual stroma is about 60 to 80 microns, whereas the central part we have come close to the three decimates layer. So the take home message is go slow with your first few surgeries. Don't be greedy or be tempted to remove entirety of the stromal bed because a few microns of residual stroma is better than a perforated DM. And ideally possible, do a lot of wet lab and observe some of the senior surgeons before you begin. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Soham, for that very practical presentation. I think it's very important that uh, we follow these practical tips before anyone starts doing DAL. So next, graduate to the next level now. So as you have seen the basics of DAL, next is all of us hear about this big bubble technique. Because in this technique, the interface is so good that the optical quality is not comparable with any of the other techniques. But however, as most of us were not competent to do it, we used to see this like a sore grapes. And we used to tell no bubble, no trouble. But Ashish has not only made those 
conquered those sore grapes. He has made it into wine. So he'll now share those tips from his experience that he worked at SNEC with the, the master of uh, Dalk himself, Professor Donald Tan, and he's also the alumni of Arvind Madurai. Ashish, welcome and please share your experience with uh, tips in getting better outcomes in Big Bubble Dalk. Thank you so much, uh, Madhu sir, for a very wonderful, kind words. I've not mastered the technique. I'm still uh, not, I'm not just struggling with it, but I'm learning every other, every other day. So uh, uh, after listening to a very lucid talk by Soham, I'll be, I'll be talking about some of the, uh, some of the techniques which I follow and which I've learned over a period of time uh, to, to improve the outcomes of uh, Big Bubble Dark. I hope my slides are visible. I hope my slides are visible. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. go ahead. Yes, okay. yes, sir. Okay. For me, I feel that there are four essentials for a successful outcome of DALC. These are ABCDs, and I'll be talking subsequently in my uh, talk what are those ABCDs. So, A is, a is an anesthesia, as very nicely mentioned by uh, Soham, that for a DALC, you always want to do under general anesthesia. It's a, it's a bit prolonged surgery. And also, the, the, the target here is to bear the Desmet's membrane. So I imagine a situation where you have bared the Desmet's membrane and patient starts moving its uh, eye. It'll be, a, it'll be nothing less than a nightmare. And also imagine if you perforate the DM, then it's an open sky procedure where, where also you want to do under general anesthesia. So until unless contraindicated, uh, general anesthesia is preferable. Second is the attitude. So we, we, we have to really understand not every case of stromal keratopathy, you need big bubble. So don't be rigid and self-egoistic. Many times you feel that, no, we can big bubble in this case also, that case also. That is not the case here. A good selection is a very essential trait of a successful surgeon. So that should be avoided in cases where you have a very thin corneas and you have a history of previous high drops and you have a deep scar. But at the same time, attempt big bubble in every case before switching to manual technique. Again, maintain balance and calm. With balance, what I mean is do not overpressurize the globe because uh, you're trying to expose the DM here. So instead of using regular castor uh, speculum, uh, it's better to use Zaffis here and always keep an eye, uh, always make sure that the, the, the globe is on the softer side to avoid bulging of the DM and aqueous formation intra-op will take care of the globe pressure. So always keep draining uh, fluid from the side port and uh, don't uh, don't worry about that eye may be, become very soft because aqueous uh, formation will continue uh, throughout the procedure and maintain calm. What and don't think that what you what you, what if you don't get bubble? You can try again, give you multiple attempts, and remember, even the most experienced surgeon can achieve big bubble only in sixty to eighty percent of the time. So it's not something if you're not able to get it that uh, it's it's something uh, which you are missing a lot. And don't think what if you perform it. Most of the time, you'll still be able to uh, continue with the dull. Very rarely, you need to convert to PK. Very importantly, be consistent. So be consistent with your technique and with your instruments. I'll be focusing mainly on instrument in this uh, talk. And this is the regular uh, uh, steps which we follow for uh, big bubble dark. So you do a partial perfection, and then you remove the superficial stroma, then inject big bubble. Uh, you can do a bubble test if you're not sure, and then uh, make a brave slash, and then inject viscoelastic material, then remove the superficial stoma, and then put a graft, and then suture it. So pre-op planning, as mentioned by Soham, is uh, very important to decide the size of the trephination and to decide the depth of the trephination. So you should be uh, you should uh, plan to cover the as much as ecthetic area of the cornea. Usually the size uh, size varies from 8, 8.25 to 8.5. And look at the thickness uh, at the uh, packy map. And look at the central packy and look at the peripheral packy both. And uh, to decide the depth of the perforation, uh, you basically want to move 30 to 60% of the anterior stroma. And the target would be to leave at least 150 to 200 microns. So suppose this cornea has a almost like 375 the 375 microns in the center, you want to remove uh, around 200. So you put your depth at 200 and then you'll be, uh, you'll be left with 175 after one pseudo second. So this is a case of post-dalc uh, inferior ectasia where you have, where actually the sum of the keratoconus probably was left while refining 
and was not removed. And later, after three years, it presented with a Rathos junction in failure. In spite of all the things which can go wrong, which you don't expect, and this is the Hana's uh, more refined system, which shows, and this is. Uh, uh, so you are putting on the cornea. Always do not uh, take the full vacuum. Take only half vacuum, and uh, then start. Uh, the start, uh, and then you there. There you go. You see the perforation. Now, so probably the cornea was thick here or was not planned properly, and then as this case will convert to uh, PK. So right tools and instruments are the most important part of achieving a good big brother. I would say. The dance marginal dissector is one of one of the most important uh, tool for achieving a big bubble, and at the same time, the big bubble cannula. And these are the other uh, scissors. Uh, Sean mentioned scissors. Other scissors are very good, and the blade markers from Thompson is again a very good addition to your instruments set. Again, marking the center is a very important aspect. So marking the center of a bigger circle is very. Uh, it's not that accurate. So basically, what you're trying to do here is. Mark, uh, trying to create a smaller circle and then mark the center of that smaller circle. So I've created four points and then marking the center in the uh, middle of that four points. Okay. The another important aspect would be to always keep the surface dry before marking so that you don't have that smudged there. And then there's a marker where you actually uh, uh, meet the two, uh, where you actually mark the center with the pointer here. This is helpful in future marking. Then coming after you have done that refine, then the stromal dissection. So there are two ways of doing stromal dissection. So I'm very nicely pointed out. I would just add a little bit here. So if you want to remain in the same plane, do a closed flap dissection. And if you think that you have gone deeper, then you'll have to do an open flap dissection. Like here, I'm doing an open flap because I think I've gone too deep and I'm scared that I may perforate. Then again, I think that, okay, now it's the plane is good. I'm maintaining the same thing with a closed flap dissection. So there's a mix of both and there's a small uh, mini scissors where you cut at the graft hose junction. Then again, a superficial uh, dissection here with the open flap. So the tip would be, if you want to maintain the same plane, do a closed flap. And if you want to do a superficial, do an open flap dissection. Then it's time to inject the bubble. Once you have done the trefine and you have seen that, okay, there is a good uh, depth stromal uh, tissue, then uh, you can create the track either with the marginal dissector or use a 27 gauge needle. The important thing here would be to, again, with the cannula, you have to go beyond the track of, uh, beyond the track which you have created. So I've already created a track here. And then now I'm going with the cannula beyond the track. So that you have a closed uh, a closed chamber there, and with the pressure of the air, the DM uh, separates. Like here, there you go. You, you have the big bubble, and then slowly take out the cannula. Once you have the bubble, make a paracentesis and decompress the anterior chamber. So. Uh, when we get a big bubble, you think you have achieved everything, but it's not the case. Like here, I was struggling. So I've got a big bubble, but I'm not able to take the cannula out. So because it has become a very high pressure chamber, and I was trying to take the cannula out, but somehow I was, I could not. So what I did was finally, this is the wrong technique. So you have to actually hold at the graft hose junction here, at the edge of the, uh, and then it comes out. Again, paracentesis to decompress. Again, don't go too much inside because you may burst the bubble. So just be on the periphery and then take it out. So the paracentesis should be vertical to avoid inadvertent rupture of the desmex member. Once you have got the uh, big bubble, now it's a defining moment, the moment for brave slash. And you put a dispersive viscoelastic here so that you uh, basically want to prevent this sudden bounce back of the desmex. Once you uh, once you get rid of that uh, bubble, so now I'm trying to attempt that slash. I'm not that brave. So small, gentle movements, repeated movements, and there you go. So you have the the bubble the escape, and then.
and then again decompress the chamber. So always, always keep decompressing the chamber at every steps. Okay, now I'm uh, trying to separate that Desmet's membrane with the posterior lamella. And there, there, this is the marginal dissector. So this marginal dissector has two uh, side projections, which actually helps a lot in removing those fibers. And it has a posterior, the posterior surface is very flat. So there's negligible risk of despair. Obviously you can go poke it, but then you'll have, but most likely you'll not have that. Another, another very important tip here is when you're dissecting, try to go beyond the margin of that graft -tose junction. So that if you go beyond and dissect it, you'll have that uh, you'll have you'll have that uh, edge to hold when doing the sutures. So donor graft preparation uh, it's very simple. Sean has already uh, talked about sizing the donor is again very important. If there is a uh, too much of myopia which you want to compensate, then probably you'll have to undersize by 2.25 mm. But if you want, if there is not much myopia, probably you can take the same size. And I remove generally both endothelium and epithelium. Epithelium just to uh, uh, just to avoid the risk of epithelial rejection. And uh, uh, we often use therapeutic grade tissues in uh, for our dull cases. So that again, a very important tip here would be since these therapeutic tissues are very thick and bulky, so it becomes difficult to suture. So always keep them uh, dry for ten minutes before you use them. So then, uh, in that case, it becomes dehydrated and the cornea actually becomes very less bulky, and then it'll be easily sutured. Again, uh, uh, you have the option of suturing with interrupted sutures or continuous sutures. Suture bite in the donor should be around 50 to 60% depth and in the post around 90% because it helps in better opposition of desmex membrane with the donor. You can see the diagram here. And uh, always use a very sharp tip needle to avoid hesitation at the graft tooth junction. Many times this is the cause that those blunt needles are the cause of the perforation. Now, uh, coming to suturing. So, even before you start sutureing, make sure that the surface, the area is dry. Here I'm trying to decompress and then I'm drying it. Uh, the reason why I'm drying it, uh, keeping it dry, because anytime if you're having that uh, perforation, aqueous will leak. And then if it is dry, you'll be able to note it. But if it is wet, then you'll not be able to note it. Again, the very important tip for this while sutureing uh, these dull cases, because most of the time perforation happen in uh, these steps. So what you do is don't come out of, uh, uh, once you have taken the bite, don't come out at once. So uh, like here, you'll see, I'm uh, going with the suture needle, holding it and then, yeah. So you have gone, you have taken a bite there and then one, two and three. So don't come out at once because the back end of the tip may perforate the dispatch membrane. And always keep it dry. So the final touch, use a, Shom has already showed, uh, use an intraop keratometer. And uh, just one point, before you use an intraop keratometer, always keep the surface wet because the Myers will be able to see the reflections of the Myers much better. And uh, if you're satisfied with the Myers, you can go ahead or you can put additional sutures or loosen those uh, sutures. I, okay. And, uh, so once you have sutures, you can put a bandage contact lenses. Again, the D is for desmex membrane. It's, it's not essential to bear desmex membrane all the time. Sometimes you'll not be able to do. And uh, so definitely visual acuity is superior. But uh, do you all respect, uh, yeah. Dr. Ashish, can you yeah, please submit it in the next one minute? It's okay. Let him continue. Okay, yeah. fine. So, yeah. Visual acuity is superior in case of big bubble dark, but again, it's comparable to manual technique. Definitely visual re recovery is much, much faster with big bubble. Manual technique also has very good results. If you are close, if you if, if the dissection, uh, if the dissection is around 80 microns of dismiss memory, the results are pretty good. Uh, some of the newer developments like femto-assisted dark and intra-OCTI uh, intra intraoposity to guide the depth of the air injection. These are very expensive tools, and it's still it's not very like, reach optimum. Uh, those so, uh, I would say uh, the experience is uh, still very lacking, and the clear cut evidence is not there, and also very expensive. So, in summary, I would say big bubble in DALC can often be achieved if you have the right case, and if you have a proper training and your sh uh, and the technique, and most importantly, if you have the right instruments with a positive attitude. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashish, for that wonderful presentation. I think that's one of the best presentations in Dalk I have heard in the recent times. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking all the efforts and time. So I think. Well, let me take the honor to introduce you then for your talk. So I'd like to introduce our chief instructor, Dr. Madhur Udraj, who's uh, trained at Arvind and at MEI in the US. He's a prolific cornea clinician, prolific surgeon, and a really nice teacher, a great teacher who all of us have learned a lot from. So looking forward to his talk on Bowman's layer transplantation in advanced keratoconus. Thank you. Thank you, Tushar. My pleasure. <laughs> My screen is visible and it's in screen mode. Yeah. Okay. So in the next few minutes, I'll uh, try to share our experience with Bowman's layer transplantation that we have been doing at our center. It is basically this technique is to uh, specifically for cases that are not suitable for cross-linking and the cases that are too early for a corneal transplant. So we are trying to uh, fill the gap in the treatment part in between these two stages. No financial disclosures, and uh, one more disclosure is whatever I'm going to tell to you is our very early experience, and it may necessarily not uh, be taken as a, a clinical this thing. So the scope of this talk would be under the following headings. Bowman's layer is not something new; it has been al already been done by Professor Mellis from so many years. There are several publications uh, that he has already published, so we had already gone through this review of literature. And uh, this is his five years results of Bowman layer transplantation. From this, I think we tried to uh, do it in our own way by modifying a bit of his technique. So truly speaking, what we are doing is not an isolated Bowman layer transplantation. In this transplant, we also add 70 to 90 microns of stroma along with the Bowman layer. So this helps us to increase the central corneal thickness and attain more flattening. And the procedure is uh, relatively less uh, difficult to learn when compared to a Bowman's layer transplantation where you have to peel it. And when compared to Melly's technique, it ours is a purely extraocular technique where we don't enter into the AC. So th these are the modifications that we have done to the Mellish technique and uh, formed our own technique and done these cases that I'm going to show you. So this is a short video of the procedure that we do. So this is the donor cornea preparation where you deprive the epithelium with a 15 number plate and then inject a air into the underlying stroma to delineate the Bowman's layer and the anterior stroma from the beneath. Once that is done, you dye it with trifan blue. Once the dyeing is done, with help of a 26 gauge needle, like you do your can opener, you do a peripheral scoring of the Bowman's layer, which is restricted to 7.5 or 8 millimeters. And then you take your regular crescent and uh, dissect it in the plane you want. So that finishes the donor part of the surgery. Now let's see the recipient's part. So this particular case is a 16 year old female with VKC. You can see those uh, scarring that you see in the superior limbus. So with the help of summer Pusak dissectors, I do a complete uh, 360 degree lamellar pocket into the corneal thing. And with help of a lens glide, I glide in the Bowman's layer into the stromal pocket. And then you can gently remove the light and iron out the folds in the Bowman's layer with a spatula or micro forceps from your retina colleagues. In this particular case, I have created a side pocket as I could not get the axis beyond the cone. So these are our results from the few cases that we did initially. The pachymetry improved by almost 100 microns and the patient became tolerant to contact lens, improving his vision. This was the first case, which now is almost two years follow. -up. This is the second case that I showed you in surgery where you can see the scarring also. Though I thought I may need to convert it into DALC, I was successful in performing the BLT in this case. And uh, the cylindrical power will also have come down by five to six diopters and the patient has again become tolerant to contact lens and doing well. This is the third case. 
This is done by my colleague, Dr. Sivaram Krishna. He followed the Melish technique. That's the reason you see the bubble in the AC. And uh, in that technique also, the results were good. And this is the Scheinflung imaging from uh, Sirius, where you can see the flattening of the apex of the cone. And not only the vision, but also the quality of vision. If you see, these are the uh, higher order aberrations that are there pre-op and post-op both comma and higher order that are specific to keratoconus that have considerably come down after the surgical intervention. So my take home message is BLT is a novel technique and apparently has a beneficial role in progressive and advanced keratoconus. It fits into the gap of uh, the treatment where they are not eligible for cross-linking and also too early for a graph. The primary outcome is stabilization of progression. The secondary outcomes are better CL contact lens tolerance and visual improvement. Improvement in pachymetry because of additional stroma in our technique makes it also eligible for a cross-linking in future or simultaneously. Reduction in astigmatism and higher order operations was seen in all the cases. This procedure, when performed in an appropriate time, can definitely reduce the need or postpone the need for a DALC or PKP. However, we need to do longer, uh, more cases and have longer follow-ups to validate our efficacy. I think Dr. Sujata Moham, ma'am, has joined us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedule. I'll hand it over to you. Ma'am will be speaking about uh, Intax and Keratoconus. Ma'am needs no introduction. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you for being there. Please go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah thank you. Okay. Sorry for joining in late and uh, there was another uh, seminar. No so, problem. Yeah, okay. So at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Madhu and the uh, scientific committee for giving me this opportunity. Please uh, do stop me if I'm exceeding my time. Uh, so this is uh, a, a small presentation of Intax, our experience. So how does Intax works? It's a crescent-shaped PMMA ring, which is inserted in the corneal stroma at the depth of about 70%. And it shortens the corneal arc length, as you can see in the picture. And the central cornea flattens, and not only that, the asymmetry in the cornea is also reduced, and thicker inserts give increased flattening. So it can be combined with other procedures, such as transepithelial cross-linking. It can show additive effect with uh, cross-linking. It can also be done with intacts, and uh, thereby not only stabilizing the cornea, but also uh, making sure that some amount of refractive effect is uh, attained by the patient. So there are two types of intacts, the standard one and the intact SK. The standard comes at seven millimeter optical zone and patients with severe cases and patients who have steeper catrometry, uh, intact SK is uh, used. And uh, the, it has a smaller optical zone of six millimeters. And so the effect on the cornea is much better. The indications are patients who are intolerant to uh, spectacles, contact lens wear, higher keratometric reading, a staging of keratoconus is more, and patients with central corneas and a spectacle cylinder of 4.5 diopters, patients with post lasic ectasia. Contraindications are patients who have a central scar, collagen vascular disorder, pregnant or nursing women, patients with recurrent corneal erosions and corneal dystrophies. So pre-surgical planning is whatever refraction that you get, you convert it into a positive cylinder. That is the most important thing. The positive cylinder gives you the steepest area. And then it, that is the area where the incision also has to go. So you, uh, you have to plan looking at the topography, the pentacam, and also uh, select the segments based on whether you're looking at a central cone uh, or a, a decentered cone. And also looking at the topography, you can probably match and see whether your, uh, your manifest uh, cylinder Refraction matches your topographic cylinder. And uh, based on the cone, you can see the centered cone, you get, can go for symmetrical uh, segments and decentered cone. You go for asymmetric segments, or you can even go for a single segment, depending upon the area that is need to be corrected. And the incision placement, you will have to decide uh, based on your positive cylinder axis, as well as other verification measures, such as uh, posterior float, the pachymetry, where the thinnest pachymetry is, the amount of peripheral flattening the patient is showing. Here you can see the segment selection where you can see the uh, asymmetric, in case of asymmetric disease, you use an asymmetric cone, as you can see in the picture, in the asymmetric picture. And the other verifiers, like I told you, was this uh, patient has a posterior float, which is very uh, shifted, very much lower down. So uh, definitely the, uh, the area of the steepest uh, area is and the area of the cone. So this is where you would insert the, uh, insert the ring and thereby the, the opposite area, the perpendicular area becomes the area where the incision is made. So these are some of the nomograms which have been come along with the uh, machine. So I'm just going to show you some cases. 
So this is a patient who had a minus 4.75 diopter uh, cylinder. So we decided to place only a single segment, as you can see that in the inferior area, and none in the superior segment and superior area. So the incision is at 45 degrees. So this uh, cylinder is at 135. So you, uh, when you go to the positive cylinder aspect, you get the 45 degrees as the steepest area, and that's where the incision is placed. So the, when, you, when you convert it, it's become minus 4.75 with plus 4.75 or 45 degrees. The incision depth is usually 70% of the area of at the six millimeter. So this is uh, uh, just a small video showing how it is done. See, uh, I uh, use a femtosecond laser. There are manual methods as well. This, it's very simple. Uh, hardly the procedure takes five to six minutes for me. Once the channels are made, I don't use any special instruments to open the channels. I use the index itself to guide, uh, the, uh, guide them into the channels. And uh, the most important thing is to know the direction. First, you have to go vertically down and then go all around. If you don't go vertically down, you will create a false channel, which can actually give rise to more problems like intrusion and extrusion, etc. So this is the first post-op day. Normally, I do a sequential uh, cross-linking. I wait for three days, and then you do. I do a cross-linking. Suppose there's some residual cylinder, then I would buy, uh, even combine it with a um, topo-guided PRK in these patients. So uh, this is a one of our PG theses, which is present about three, four years back. We had 34 eyes of 31 patients who had intacts. You can see some of them had an excellent response of, uh, in dioptric control of 6.95. So you can see the cylinder here is minus six, which is dropped down to minus two. The spherical from minus two to minus, uh, minus 0.48. So this patient had a plus three with a minus seven cylinder at 155 degrees. So when you transpose it, you get the axis at 65 degrees, and this is where the incision is made. And you get, because of the cylindrical, as well as the, the higher amount of a mean spherical equivalent, you go for symmetrical rings on both sides. So you can see the ASOCT of this uh, patient and the cross-linking effect. The, again, another patient showing centralization, centralization of the cone with a drop in the K-max from 56.7 to 50.1. This is again a patient showing a draw, excellent response to, uh, to cross uh, to intacts from minus nine to minus two. You can see the difference map as well. This is again a patient showing a flattening by four diopters. So this is a pre and post-op intacts with minus 7.5, you have done, gone down to minus 4.5. This is again a patient who had a uh, Gertokonus grade three. And you can see the planning, I just go back a little. So when you plan this patient, patient had a minus four with minus 7.5 cylinder. So we decided to go ahead with a symmetric segment of 0.45 at 130, 130 degrees axis. So that is the steepest axis and the patient showed an excellent response as you can see here. So again, a patient with minus 2.25 with minus four cylinder. So the planning here was to go for an asymmetric segment, 0.4 uh, inferiorly and 0.25 superiorly with an incision at 130 degrees. Again, the patient showed a very uh, excellent response. As you can see, the cylinder dropped to minus 1.5. So this is again a patient with minus 5.5 uh, uh, to 115 degrees and decided to go for a single segment because there was no uh, spherical uh, component in this patient. And this patient also pre-op uh, pre and the post-op, you can see the response. So the response is often variable. We get somewhere between 50 to 70% response in most of the patients. And uh, uh, it depends upon the pliability of the cornea and thinner the cornea, more pliable, we get be better results. And once you get the better results, it's immediately, it's important that you seal it in and do a cross-linking immediately. If you wait for too long, they might have a drift. So in our patient, the average reduction in cylinder post intact was about 3.75 diopters. You can see here the blue uh, line showing the, uh, the, uh, the effect from minus seven to minus two. And this is a mean a spherical equivalent. That is a slight drift over a period of a uh, few months. But when you compare it with the topo guided PRK, you can see the significant response from pre-op minus 6.13, it has dropped down to 2.7 and topo-guided PRK from 2.7 to 0.75 because we do topo-guided PRK in lower cylinders, not in higher cylinders. So our results were very good from uh, uh, uncorrected visual equity, uh, equity improved from 0.89 to 0.61 log mark. Steep captometric values dropped from 52 to 47 and spherical values decreased by 4.5 diopters and cylindrical values decreased by 3.5. So intax is an excellent procedure from mild to moderate keratoconus Cross-linking should be done in the same sitting or sequentially to strengthen the cornea. Thank you.
So I try to keep up my time. I hope it was too not, not too fast. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that very lucid and uh, practical presentation. I, I think we still have uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes for panel discussion. So uh, I think first we'll go to Tushar. Yeah. Tushar, uh, so regarding COVIS, yeah. uh, uh, how, how often do you use this technique or the, are there any specific conditions apart from tomography you want to use this COVIS or you use it routinely for all your cases? I think uh, the the area where it plays the most role is those borderline cases, you know, where you have a, a topography where, you know, which is borderline, you have a slightly thin cornea, no changes on elevation, the curvature looks fine, and you want to really take a call if, if this cornea is something that you want to intervene on, do a refractive surgery on or not. And, you know, a lot of times you find interesting uh, relevations there. Uh, so that is where it really adds application. And sometimes, you know, you there are some corneas which are normal and you find biomechanical weakness. So we really don't know the significance of that yet unless you go ahead and in vitro analyze the cornea, which is not possible. So yeah. that's, what I, that's why I said that biomechanics is in its infancy right now. There is information that we get, but there is a lot more that we would be getting, say, five years from now when we have more sensitive tools. Okay. So the implications of a lot of things that we find in uh, biomechanics is still to be known. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody wants to add to his discussion from the panel, please go ahead and do it regarding the biomechanics. Sujata, ma'am, your experience I, with... I don't have any, I don't have an access to uh, Converse, okay. Okay. but uh, I, we had it as a temporary measure. We did use it um, for about 15 days. The only thing I found was that it's uh, really not very... Um, you know, conclusive because sometimes in Keltoconus patients, uh, you get a normal readings and then normal patients show uh, reduces uh, uh, corneal hysteresis. So I'm really not convinced about uh, uh, that so much. So I didn't want to acquire it. But I think uh, over a period of several years, I think this is definitely has taken up as one of the other parameters that we look into when we uh, try to take a patient for um, cross for uh, uh, for any procedure, refractive procedure. Yes. Uh, the only probably the only place where you would uh, look into it is like when you are in suspicion, but you have an asymmetric uh, parameters and you're a little bit worried about doing a corneal based refractive surgery, maybe having an additional information uh, would definitely help. If you're very sure the patient has a good biomechanics, then probably the, you can probably do a surface ablation or something and get away with it. So this will be an additional tool and when you're in doubt. I don't know whether we can do it as a routine procedure for all patients. Yeah, Tushar was just telling the same, ma'am. It's like in the evolving phase and probably a few years down the line, we'll get some solid data from it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your inputs. Next, I think, uh, Divya, ma'am. Yes, Madhu. I'm here. Yeah, so first of all, uh, you, disconnected uh, during this. I was mentioning that thank you for taking time. Though we are recovering from COVID, despite of that, you had to keep this thank academic you. commitment. Thank you. And uh, ma'am, regarding the uh, topo guided PRK, are there any conditions that you would not touch or you would plan for a, are there certain exclusion criteria where you would not do it? Uh, no, but as I mentioned, you know, when the patient has any active uh, inflammation or when there is a corneal scar or when there is high-grade keratoconus, then definitely no. Okay. And those, because, and the other thing is, you know, to convince the patient, I'm not sure where my, uh, you know, presentation stopped, but again, convincing the patient, uh, you know, to get this procedure done uh, because it's more of, you know, regularizing the cornea. And we are right. not actually treating the vision per se. Uh, yeah. The quality of vision will definitely help. You know, I use the simulation, uh, the visual quality simulation, to explain to the patient. So, pre and you know, when we remove the abrasions, this is how your uh, quality of vision is going to be. Uh, okay. Some cases you can see when you remove the abrasions, you know, the quality drastically improves uh, on the vision uh, simulator. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, it does not. So then we ourselves can decide, you know, whether the patient will improve or not. Yeah. Because, you know, when you do a refractive procedure, you know, the first thing the mindset they have is exactly. to have good vision. So that, that was the reason I was asking, how do we convince them to get this procedure done? 
So you well, are. Can I, can I just put in a uh, my uh, this thing? See, normally uh, what we find is when we do. I was not listening to the Divya's. He just joined in late. So when we put zero zero. and then uh, you do the correction the main idea is not to correct the refractive cylinder the idea is to correct the abrasion only and then you get a very high degree of depth of ablation which is exceeding uh, what you can normally do like may more than 40 then then obviously the abrasion is too high for us to use a, a topo guided laser but if you get somewhere around 20 25 this is something which is correctable so that is how you look at it so the higher the co correction that you need the you know the abrasion is very high and definitely it will not correlate the other thing is if you have your spectacle cylinder is too far away from your uh, uh, your um, uh, topographic cylinder then again you must reconsider the whole thing because this type of irregular astigmatism also sometimes the results may not be good so you have to look at the depth of ablation and also the amount of uh, variation from the spectacle cylinder that you have and then uh, take this uh, patients into consideration see in these patients where we cannot do a do topo guided prk i do what is called as an ketins um, uh, uh, protocol where uh, we uh, look at the epithelial map and the area over the uh, cone is usually thinner by about 5 or 10 microns so using a laser to ablate uh, uh, this area additionally uh, ablates a little bit of the uh, elevated zone so it gives rise to some amount of say about half or one diopter of uh, symmetry to the cornea so when when the topo guided prk cannot be done the my next choice would be to go for a ptk uh, cretins protocol so the, and then follow it up with the cross linking so that also can be done thank you ma'am thank you so much for that practical experience you have given us uh, next soham Yes. Do you regularly use the flaring ring for all your cases? No, 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 no. That was one of my very beginning cases. But okay. uh, in case there is a uh, previous high drops, it would be prudent for beginners to use a flaring ring. Okay. Always very nice videos. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, and uh, Ashish, for the sake of Ashish, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me. for the sake of our delegates uh, they would be interested to know where they can procure those beautiful instruments you showed them so uh, most of the instruments are from asico uh, <laughs> okay. the tans marginal dissector and the cannula which i use which are very good foglas cannula are also very good i have not i have not experienced that okay. but uh, what i think is that tans uh, big bubble cannula really works and the most essential instrument for any corneal surgeon i would suggest is the uh, tans marginal dissector okay. we have to buy those uh, dissectors i think indian company i am not sure if joja is making a similar instrument but this is not very expensive and you can buy it from asico again uh, the needles the suture needles which i use is also from uh, money now money blades are there and now they have started giving sutures also they are a bit expensive but if you are doing a cornea practice i think uh, you may need those uh, sutures very sharp needles those are the sharpest needles in the world so okay. those are the three things is definitely recommended apart from that hanas moria trifine is a very expensive uh, set uh, i have got it and it's it's more than 6 lakhs and you have those uh, blades and uh, uh those uh, rings those are again very expensive but again if you keep those rings and blades uh, nicely uh, that will last uh, for very long and you, you you cannot have that uh, those sharpness and those precision with any other trifine the manual trifine is out of question and uh, <laughs> uh, but this is th these are the things hanas trifine you can hanas moria system is not essential but other things other those three things are very essential if you are practicing dark if you are doing Uh, a significant number of uh, dark in your practice you can you. use barrens also barrens is also uh, practically good we have been using barrens for more than 20 years hanas is a little bit expensive for uh, anybody particularly a beginning surgeon but uh, barrens is disposable barrens is quite you can uh, use it for three four cases and then you can dispose it off yeah. it also to a certain extent it helps in regulating the depth of uh, your yeah that that's the most essential thing i think the the depth Plus uh, that standard deviation of plus minus twenty microns yeah. uh, is uh, really makes I think some difference to a big bubble achievement. I think yeah, I think uh, that 
I think answers most of the queries of the delegate. And I, I should thank all the delegates who are attending and I'll also be happy to share with them that uh, all these presentations have been of the highest quality and I'm also happy to tell this, this IC was accepted as it is for the last year's ASCRS and whoever is watching it uh, now or on the recorded version, I think this is the content we planned for last year. So thank you all the speakers for uh, putting in your time and efforts and making this IC a wonderful thing. I think we still have five more minutes. I open it to discussion from any of the panelists. Thank you once again. So Madhu sir, I think one of the things that we can discuss and which I believe has reduced our uh, us doing dialects a lot is contact lenses. So, uh, how, so what is your indication for dialect in the current scenario is what I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ashish and Soham as well. And you yeah. know, do you offer uh, scleral lenses to all your patients to begin with and then go for dialic in the ones who don't want it or the ones who are not accepting scleral lenses because most of the advanced keratoconus also improve quite well. Uh, the lenses lenses, yeah. So in the current scenario, scenario, what are your indications? Absolutely right, Tushar, because now the incidence of uh, dialic has definitely come down because the, the quality of uh, vision the patient has with the contact lenses it's so good. I mean, there is no uh, need for us to shift to dialc unless the cornea is extremely thin or can go in for a perforation or things like that. But other than that, you know, most of my patients, like majority of my patients, 70% of my patients, they are very happy with these mini scleral lenses because the qual the, it doesn't fall down. The quality of vision is uh, excellent. And these patients are very young. They are 18, 19, 20. And then you put them through a corneal transplant at this age then there is definitely some amount of related complications which can happen at a later date. So I definitely would give them the trial of contact lenses first and then before uh, um, uh, pushing them for a uh, keratoplasty. So very uh, rightly said, uh, I also feel that the number of dials has come down. The two reasons, one is those sterile and mini sterile lenses. The other thing is we are picking up these cases. These, these cases are presenting very early and then we are doing cross-linking. So uh, many studies, like two, three couple of studies have come and they have shown the impact that they've done a epidemiology study and they've found that because of the interventions, early interventions with the cross-linking, the number of patients requiring that has actually come down. So that is uh, there, but to answer your question, I think it's still, uh, it's, uh, we, we still do see some cases which uh, require a uh, Like uh, when in Arvind, uh, when I was there, we were doing around 100, 150 cases of DALC in a year which was still very high, but over the period of time, uh, during my term the, itself, we saw the decrease happening. And then we also realized that because of the, probably because of the scleral lenses and cross-linking, the number has come down. The cases still are there, it's the same. Mostly the cases are cross, uh, those keratoconus, advanced keratoconus, and uh, those cases of, of post-infection, those scars, those, uh, those still make a lot of uh, cases for uh, those post-infectious scars, uh, the keratoconus numbers of uh, requiring keratoconus numbers which require adult has really come down drastically. So for the sake of the delegates, can anyone just uh, touch upon the cost involved in the scleral lenses? What would be the recurrent cost for the patient so that when they want to advise this? I think the mini, mini scleral lenses are not that expensive. It's around 10, 12,000. Whereas the Boston lenses, which has started manufacturing in the country now, because the cost has become half, it's around 36, I think, 30, 36,000. And uh, the, the, the other lenses, uh, the other version of those mini style lenses are around 15,000 from uh, that PureCon company. Yes. So these last for one year? Yeah, they'll know. They'll, 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 no, they'll, they'll, they'll the lenses for three to five years. Three years, you can easily go. If, if yes. you maintain properly, the, the user can easily wear it for three years. Three years. Actually, claim five years, but three years, I think, is uh, yes. because what will happen is you'll have too many scratches on the lenses. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, that sums all of it. Any other uh, inputs from the panelists? We have just. I think just for the biomechanics, I feel uh, it's, I, I think it is already there. It has gone through its infancy period. I think now people have started accepting it. The only thing is, we as a surgeon, we as a clinician are not able to accept accept it. We 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 are we have still don't have that confidence on those parameters which which it is showing. It, it, it's the same for the pentacam. Those D values or those other values for a very long time we were not able to believe it. But over the period of time, we felt okay, this is this is 
working. This is like we became confident. Similarly for the, I think Corvus, I think same going to happen probably in a couple of years. Yeah. So we probably uh, like we need to start trusting biomechanics more ourselves, and you know, Ashish sir can help with the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I want epithelial map incorporated to that. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so advocacy so, for cornea surgeons to adopt new technologies. New technology. <laughs> so that should be a one in all machine, basically. I mean, we that stop. will not do. <laughs> that that <yes. laughs> so We have some budget from uh, Standard Charter to have those machines. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, that we have to hand over this all to the next thing. Thank you all once again. Ashish. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you, Madhu, sir. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. giving us. Thank you so Thank much, Honorable Chair Chairperson, Dr. Madhu Dar Raju. Thank you so much for chairing this session and all the renowned speakers for me enlightening this session. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity, Madhu. Welcome, ma'am. Pleasure always to have you. <laughs> <laughs>